When new life enters our world, it beckons beings from the other realm. Some come bearing blessings for the newborn, like the fates of the Fae. Others come on moonlit nights, bearing terrible omens, like the Devil's Wing, who appears clad in bearskin, and who is known by many names. But my name is Radiana, and I shall carry you across the threshold of ordinary reality and take you on a journey throughout the realms of Romanian, Greek, and Jewish folklore in search of the demon's true name. Thus, be warned, in this exploration we will face the perils and anguish of childbirth tragedies. For some, this may evoke deep emotions and discomfort. If you find them distressing, I encourage you to skip this video and explore others that resonate with you on my channel. Thank you. And now, our journey begins. Throughout universal folklore and mythology, we find distinctive supernatural beings who make their presence known when new life enters the world. Pregnancy and childbirth, otherwise beautiful and sacred experiences believed to be protected by fertility goddesses, totemic spirits and fates of the Fae, can be likewise marred by fears, anxieties and negative emotions that give birth to demons. Quite often, these demons also embody the archetype of the succubus, the seductive female night demon who, at its core, is the personification of the belief that female sexuality is a source of danger and temptation. Meanwhile, its male counterpart, the incubus, is more often associated with awakening instincts and female hysteria. Whether they appear masculine or feminine, these night demons are believed to draw vitality or life force from their unsuspecting victims by exploiting their desires and vulnerabilities, leaving them weakened or even deceased. In Jewish folklore, Lilith is believed to be one such demon. In fact, she is crowned the succubus queen and mother of all monsters. Her origins, however, are deeply rooted in Mesopotamian mythology, where she was initially portrayed as a storm demon associated with the wind. Over time, she became a demon of the night who seduces men, causes harm to women during childbirth, and steals infants from their cradles. Tracing the side of Lilith to ancient Mesopotamia leads us to Lamashtu, who was believed to be a harbinger of disease and death during pregnancy and childbirth. A daughter of the god Anu, Lamashtu was depicted as a grotesque creature with the body of a woman, the head of a lioness, and the feet of a bird of prey, whose malevolence extended to poisoning water, draining the life force of plants, inducing nightmares, and causing disease. She was believed to have the power to harm pregnant women and take the lives of their unborn children merely by touching their stomachs seven times. And she was said to kidnap children from their mothers as they were breastfeeding, to gnaw on their bones and suck their blood. And there are lesser known sisters of Lamashtu and Lilith that can be found throughout the ancient world. Namely, yellow of Greek folklore likewise embodies the archetype of the succubus as a seductive ghost demon who ensnares men with her beauty and steals the lives of children. And in the same realm of Greek mythology, we also find a tragic Lamia who transformed into a child-eating monster after the lives of her own offspring with Zeus were taken by Hera. And then there are the Isles of Caucasian and Central Asian folklore, the demonic entities who interfere with human reproduction and childbirth, such as the infamous al karisi or Scarlet Woman of Turkish folklore who threatens the lives of new mothers by harvesting their livers in order to feed her own demonic offspring. And in Romanian folklore, we have Samka. Also known as Avesta or Avestica in certain regions, Samka is similar to her aforementioned sisters, although her embodiment of the succubus archetype is rather minimal, nearly non-existent. Whilst there are a few tales here and there of her appearing in the dreams of the newly wedded, the tales of her harming mothers and their children, as well as the rituals for protection against her, make up most of her lore. Like the Mesopotamian Lamashtu, Samka also induces nightmares and causes disease. She has many names and is haunted by the Archangel Michael, like the Greek ghost demon Yellow. And like Lilith, 
she is a threat to one's lineage and can be banished by the use of certain charms and talismans. Much of what we know about Samka is not only from folk tales, but also from charms and incantations used by village healers, midwives and witches, as well as prayers from manuscripts left behind by Christian priests, deacons and monks. More precisely, the clergy contributed to her folklore with prayers involving Saint Sisois and Archangel Michael, leading to the creation of the Book of Avestitsa, which is a protective charm that attempts to unveil the demon's many names and true history, according to Christian demonology. In traditional folklore, Samka is described as a dangerous entity, often referred to as the Dragon's Wing, which was transcribed by the clergy as the Devil's or Satan's Wing. The name Samka comes from the Old Slavonic Samuka, which means woman, and Senka, which means shadow, and it is rooted in the Proto-Indo-European Ske, which means murky or shady. The second name of the demon, Avesta or Avestica, is likewise rooted in the Old Slavonic Veshtica, meaning witch, and it may come from the Proto-Indo-European Vech to referring to someone inspired, raging or possessed. Tales and incantations describe Samka as a draconic spirit, who can appear as a very large and fierce pig, or a grinning dog showing awful teeth, or a hairless cat with fiery bulging eyes, or a crow with bloody eyes, or a big black spider. But more often, she takes the form of a woman, sometimes old, sometimes naked, and other times clad in bare skin, with disheveled hair extending down to her heels, and long breasts thrown over her shoulders or touching the ground. She is said to have small eyes that shine as brightly as stars or embers, and iron hands with long nails, as sharp as knitting needles or as hooked as sickles. She has a very large, ugly and crooked mouth with a long tongue that always spits fire. At the end of each month, around the full moon, she shows herself to pregnant women and children, whom she frightens so terribly that they immediately become sick. She is said to also appear to women during childbirth, kneading on their chests and bellies, which causes death or permanent damage to their health. She is said to also torment women who seek to lose their unborn child, those who practice witchcraft before or after childbirth, and those who use divination to learn if they are pregnant. Due to her fright-inducing attacks that leave physical marks, Samka is considered the most active and virulent demonic entity in Romanian folklore. Her attacks are said to result in chronic fear and spasms, a condition aptly named Samka when it affects women, or the children's malice when it affects children. Women visited by Samka during pregnancy or after childbirth claim that they would wake up frightened at night or experience very vivid dreams in which a variety of animals, insects or quicksilver droplets were moving around their bodies, making a natural sounds and disappearing into thin air. These visions were so terrifying in some cases that they could cause a miscarriage. As the attacks escalated, they also experienced symptoms described as violent twisting of the face, followed by cramps, strange contortions of the limbs, and madness, sometimes tragically leading to death. Those who survived the ordeal were said to be marked for life by the demon, remaining disfigured and sensitive to new attacks in their next pregnancy. For the rest of their lives, they suffered from tremors, spasms, involuntary muscle contractions, livid color of the body, joint stiffness, fainting, foaming at the mouth, startled responses during sleep, heavy sighing, and other symptoms understood today as a clinical description of epileptic seizures. Archaic folk medicine treated them with cures made from flat sea holly or blue eringo, aptly named some kind popular language. Bird's eye speedwell and hedge mustard flowers, referred to by the diminutive form samkutse, were also used in the making of cures. These cures were always accompanied by religious or folk magic practices, many of which have pre-Christian origins, either indigenous or assimilated from other cultures. Many incantations and rituals of exorcism against Samka have survived to this day, describing spiritual battles between the healer and the demon, while also painting a picture of the children's malice disease. This often differed from one region to another and even from one healer to another, but they all followed a similar structure. One incantation tells how Samka lifted up and struck the victim to the ground, 
which was considered the cause of the confused and frightened state of the child. This was followed by a description of Samka entering the chest, which is the metaphor for chest pain. To cure the child, the healer would recite the incantation and, depending on their age, they would use a needle to pierce the disease believed to be hidden either in the cow's milk or the mother's. The healer would then cast out the demon into a fish, namely the barbel, considered the sacred spirit of the water and a primordial creature in Romanian folklore. The healer would offer it as a sacrifice in exchange for the child's life. A ruse, intended to lead some guy to the depths of the uncreated waters of the primordial ocean, where the barbell rests, and where everything becomes nothing, just like at the beginning of time. One of the most common elements in all exorcisms or rituals of protection against Samka stems from the belief that knowing an entity's true name grants power or control over it. And so, any ritual to cure the children's malice or deliver a pregnant woman from the demon involves calling out its names. Four of them you already know. Samka, Avestica, Satan's Wing, and the children's malice. But she has many more. Over 99. Religious scholars, however, condense them to only 19, even altering some of them to fit a biblical narrative. That is because many of her names sound like derivatives of each other. They were likely created for poetic rhythm meant to help traditional healers remember the incantation and induce altered states. Some of her names are even said to belong to witches who doubled in diabolical sorcery against children. Others seem to indicate types of microbe spirits and as many diseases. But there are a few that I find rather interesting. In some incantations, the demon is referred to as Salmona or Solomia, which, when considering her draconic nature, gives a silent nod to the myth of the Scolomans and its sorcerers. In some other incantations, she is named Dezana, Zalina, Zurina or Zoitza, referring to one of the fairy nymphs in the divine entourage of the maiden goddess. While demons and fairies are distinct beings in many mythologies and belief systems, the significance of their true names and the potential consequences of revealing them are similar. In both cases, and here Samka seems to be a hybrid of the two, knowing their name can reveal their true nature and abilities and thus be used to summon, command or bind them. And so it is said that the most effective way to ward off Samka is to write all her names on the walls of the house or on a piece of paper to be worn in an amulet. It was often advised that the names should be written by an elderly person because it was believed that Samka would hunt down the person who learned her names. And if that person was elderly and lived a long life, she would not be able to take their life, but instead make them grind their teeth in their sleep. The names of Samka, adapted and condensed to 19 by religious scholars, were recorded in the fascinating charm titled The Book of Avestica. Many of the traditional rituals and beliefs regarding Samka were first overruled and subsequently influenced by the creation of this binding book. It saw wide circulation between the 17th and 19th centuries, and it was used as a talisman booklet and exorcism prayer. There are several regional versions of the booklet, each with interesting specific elements, but almost all of them are based on a biblical narrative manufactured by the clergy into a prayer that was often accompanied by a drawing of Archangel Michael striking Samka with his sword. The most remarkable version of the prayer was reproduced by ethnologist Tudor Panfile from a manuscript dating back to 1809, and it reads as follows. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, the servant of God, Saint Sisawis, descending from the mountain of Ilion, so Avestica, Satan's wing, whose hair reached down to her heels with fiery red eyes, twisted limbs, and a wild gaze. Her body was deformed, and she was very mighty and terrifying. Passing by her, I heard a voice from heaven, and I saw Archangel Michael, the heavenly prince, who said to her, Hold, Satan, unclean spirit, in the name of God. And she immediately stopped and stared in terror at the angel. He said to her, I say to you, Satan, unclean spirit, where do you come from, and where are you going, and what is your name? She, looking back in dread and staring fiercely at the angel, said, I am Avestica, Satan's wing, an unclean spirit, and I come now from the depths of hell because I heard Archangel Gabriel spreading the good word 
that from a pure Virgin Mary, the daughter of Joachim and Anne, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the heavenly and earthly King, will be born. So I come with my great seen and unseen powers. Then Archangel Michael grabbed her by the hair of her head and thrust his sword into her side, striking her fiercely with a burning fire. And the angel asked her, You unclean spirit, how and in what forms do you shape yourself and enter people's houses to take their children? And she said, I enter in their sleep with my great seen and unseen powers. But the angel struck her fiercely. She, in great pain and burning, cried out loudly, begging him to stop beating her, and she would reveal everything to him. When he stopped, she said, I become a dog and a cat. I become a shadow and a locust. I become a spider and a fly, and all the seen and unseen spirits I can become. Thus I enter people's houses to disturb their mothers when they are heavy, and I take even their faces when they are asleep. I rather like the child's mother when she is in labor and in her shame. However, I also come to the one who is awake, to the charmer, to the one who searches with a sieve or reads the grains, and to the one who does not keep justice with her husband. And I have ninety names. And submitting myself with great determination to you, holy Archangel Michael, behold, I entrust this seal of mine into the hand of your great power, holy angel, so that wherever this seal of mine may be, in any house, I may not approach within seven miles of that place, and I shall have no business at that house. This text was read, including the names, three times a day in sets of three days for three months. And although the reading was part of a more elaborate ritual of exorcism, there was but one thing that ensured its success. Compensation. Between the 17th and 19th centuries, when these booklets were created and circulated far and wide, Priests, deacons, and monks were among the very few with the ability to read and write such complex texts. Furthermore, their erudition and priesthood made them seem closer to the realm of the sacred than traditional healers, and so they capitalized on the belief of the people that anyone learning Samka's true name would be at risk. They claimed that reading and writing the booklet put them at great risk of physical and spiritual contamination, but since they were the only ones with the ability to do it, they would. For a price, and so they would request to be compensated handsomely, and even claim that the higher the compensation, the more effective the prayer. They likewise claim that every wife should keep the binding book in her house, and wear it as a talisman from the moment she becomes pregnant until months or even seven years after childbirth. But for this to be effective, they had to bless the booklet at the church first, where, as you know, you should never go empty-handed. When they could not afford the payment, the people turned to the elderly in the village or family who, even if they were not engaging in magical or religious practices, would lend a helping hand. Many among the elderly made a habit of writing talismans, including traditional healers who needed to adapt their craft to the demand. Through their altered versions of the booklet, we see the folkloric ethos re-entering the Christian framework. A rather small but impactful detail that demonstrates this is that their booklets would feature the image of Archangel Michael striking Samka not with a sword, but a whip. Now, the whip is a traditional instrument in Romanian folk magic practices, and it is often used with the belief that evil spirits are disturbed or frightened by the cracking sound of the whip or by the sound of striking pots together. The Book of Avestitsa is undoubtedly the product of Semitic Christian and pre-Christian syncretism. It involves beliefs and practices assimilated from Semitic and Christian demonology that were likely conflated with the native belief in a pre-Indo-European fertility goddess. The traditional Samka is thus put in a biblical context, much like her Greek counterpart Yelo, who suffered a very similar fate in Greek folklore. Some scholars have traced the origins of Yelo to the Mesopotamian demons collectively referred to as Galu, which were set to drag souls to the underworld, and snatch the sun from a man's knee. Meanwhile, the Greek root of her name is believed to mean grin or laugh, describing the mocking and grimacing expression of the entity or someone possessed by it. In classical antiquity and as far back as the 6th century BC, Yellow was feared as a threat to children and was believed to cause infertility, miscarriage and infant mortality. She was portrayed as a young woman who died a virgin and returned as a vengeful ghost or revenant to harm children, virgins, and newborns. During the Byzantine era, however, she became a collective entity, and women believed to be possessed by them 
were sometimes subject to trials or exorcisms. Over time, she was conflated with Lamia and Mormo, who, like her, were said to have once been human but due to spiritual transgression, turned into child-eating monsters. Likewise, the collective entity later became synonymous with diabolical witches or old crones, who were said to make pacts with the devil and consume the flesh and blood of infants. And, similar to Romanian tradition, charm books and talisman pouches were used for protection. One such charm book dating back to the 15th century claims that in the time of Trian the king, Melitene, the sister of Saint Sicinios, lost six children to yellow. After becoming pregnant with her seventh child, she retreated to a fortress where the demon could not reach her in order to give birth. When her brothers, Sicinios, Sines, and Sinodoros sought entry, Yelo transformed into a fly on one of their horses and thus invaded the fortress and took the life of the newborn. An angel then intervened and instructed the three brothers to pursue the demon. Thus, they compelled the demon to resurrect all of Melitene's children, which the demon accomplished with the mother's milk. The brothers then continued to torment Yellow, who pleaded for mercy in exchange for a charm against her. She revealed that she would be warded off by a charm inscribed with their three names, as well as her twelve and a half names. In later versions of the charm, Saint Sicinius is replaced by the Archangel Michael, who, just like in the Book of Avestitsa, questions the demon, asking where it came from and where it intends to go. The demon responds that it plans to enter a house in the form of a snake or dragon to harm the women inside, make their hearts ache, drop their milk, and take the lives of their children. The striking similarities are not limited to the Romanian and Greek charms. Medieval manuscripts written in Greek, Coptic, Ethiopian, Armenian, Romanian, Slavonic, Arabic, and Hebrew all point to the source of the biblical narrative which was conflated with native beliefs and reveal an underlying policy of religious proselytization through syncretism. Some of the charms also date back to the 5th or 6th century and are inscribed in Aramaic on objects such as metal leaf sheets and incantation bowls. In some of these, the demon is named after the Aramaic form of the Greek sideros, which means iron. It must be noted that, throughout the centuries, Greek and Romanian religious scholars persistently attempted to trace Yellow and Samka to Lilith in Jewish folklore, despite them being distinctive mythical figures. Lilith herself has been persistently conflated with the Mesopotamian Lamashtu, or she who erases, who likewise had several names and incantations against her. However, many scholars believe that Lilith's original function was different from that of Lamashtu, and this is suggested by her etymology. The root Lil is believed to stem from the Sumerian word for storm, or referring to a wind that carried disease. In some texts, the male Lilu and female Lilitu are referred to or associated with storm deities. It is possible that a misinterpretation of etymology and connections with the Semitic word Lil, meaning nightmare, nightbird, or night hag, transform these entities into creatures linked to nocturnal terrors. The earliest documented appearance of Lilith is in the story of Inanna and the Hulupu tree from the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh, discovered on a tablet in Ur dating to around 2000 BC. And this tale, set after the separation of heaven and earth and the creation of humanity, the goddess Inanna attempts to craft a throne and bed from the wood of a willow tree. However, the tree had been overtaken by a dragon who set up its nest at the base of the tree, the zubert who placed its young in its crown, and the demoness Lilith, who built her house in its midst. Hearing of Inanna's distress, Gilgamesh rushes to her aid and defeats the dragon, compelling the Zuber to flee to the mountains, while Lilith, terrified, tears down her dwelling and escapes into the desert. Her opposition to Inanna was recreated in the biblical narratives, where Lilith antagonizes Eve and the Shekinah, and the motif of her fleeing to desolate places became a central element of her mythology in the centuries that followed. According to the alphabet of Ben Sira, when God created Adam, he also made a woman named Lilith from the same earth. However, the two did not get along, with Adam demanding submission and Lilith asserting her equality. Frustrated by Adam, Lilith uttered God's ineffable name and flew away into the air. Adam prayed to God, and, according to the text, the Holy Blessed One immediately dispatched the three angels, Senoi, San Senoi, and Semangelov, after her to bring her back. God said, If she wants to return, well and good. 
and if not, she must accept that a hundred of her children will die every day. The angels pursued her and overtook her in the sea in raging waters and told her God's orders, and yet she did not want to return. They told her they would drown her in the sea, and she replied, Leave me alone. I was only created in order to sicken babies. If there are boys, from birth to day eight I will have power over them. If there are girls, from birth to day twenty. When they heard her reply, they pleaded with her to come back. She swore to them in the name of the living God, that whenever she would see them, or their names, or their images on an amulet, she would not overpower that baby, and she accepted that a hundred of her children would die every day. Therefore a hundred demons die every day, and therefore we write the names of the three angels on amulets of young children. When Lilith sees them, she remembers her oath, and the child is protected and healed. Now, the 10th century text is considered controversial and even satirical by many Jewish scholars, but it does depict the long-standing tradition of crafting protective amulets with the names of the three angels against Lilith. Some of them also have visual depictions of the angels' forms, which were believed to increase protection. The combined resonance of their names, Senoi, Sansenoi, Semangelov, carry an ominous quality when spoken, reminiscent of the hissing of a snake or crackling fire, warning Lilith to stay away from the mother and her newborn child. In Christian versions of these amulets, the angels are replaced by saints whose names are phonetically similar and which have evolved over time to align with the cultural context in which they were assimilated. And so, Senoi became Saint Sisovis, San Senoi became Sisinios, and Semangelov became Sinidores. The names of the angels can be found in manuscripts dating as early as the 1st century and on incantation balls from the 1st through 6th centuries. The prevalence of these ancient balls, often commissioned by women, reveals their direct association with the Lilith myth and their fears of losing their children during pregnancy, childbirth or infancy, reflecting what were likely alarmingly high rates of infant mortality during that era. It also reveals to us a form of female agency exercised through the use of magical practices. Testament to this is an ancient terracotta tablet discovered in northern Syria and dating back roughly to the same era as the Sumerian epic, which portrays Lilith as a winged sphinx and includes an incantation that reads, O oh, you who traverse the shadowed chambers, depart from this place at once, this very instant Lilith, thief and bone breaker. The tablet bears a hole at the top, suggesting it was likely used as a protective amulet hung on a wall, and the lines form a part of an incantation employed to safeguard women during childbirth, a practice prevalent during the Assyrian Empire and the New Babylonian Kingdom, when it was believed that the mere sight of Lilith's name inscribed on the plague would likely frighten her and compel her to flee. This journey into Greek and Jewish folklore was necessary for us to better understand the nature of Samka and where the religious practices against her came from. The Mesopotamian and Semitic origins of the Christian framework resonated with the folk magic practices of the people in Eastern and Southeastern Europe. However, the Christian framework influenced the beliefs of the people by amplifying the demonism of Samka and Yelo and manufacturing the need for a more viable method of protection against them. And so many today view Samka according to Christian demonology. To them, she is Satan's right-hand demon, who lacks free will and is dispatched by him or his diabolical witches to harm children and their mothers. However, the folkloric character of Samka described in traditional incantations reveals her forgotten nature. In many, she is described as walking on all fours clad in bearskin, appearing to her victims on full moon nights, twisting their limbs, destroying their chests, covering their eyes with a spidery web, drinking their blood, eating their flesh, and taking away all their strength. This points to her having evolved from an ancient totem, quite possibly the bear. In Romanian folklore, this totem is referred to as the elder bear. It is considered a mythical ancestor, and is observed in the popular calendar several times a year. It is also the totem of the fates in Romanian folklore, who are of the fey kind, and whose collective name in Romanian has the same root as the word bear. It is said that anointing a newborn child immediately after birth with bear fat wins the favor of the fates. In certain regions, 
It is also believed that fumigating a child with bear hair can cure them of nightmares. Even baptizing a child with the name Bear is said to win the favor of the Elder Spirit and the Fates in warding off any illness. And, especially in mountain villages, it is believed that every person has not only a star in the sky, but also a twin bear on earth who was born at the same time as them. These customs were inspired by the reverence and protective nature of the she-bear, whose connection to the Fates and childbirth suggests the existence of a totemic female cult dedicated to a fertility goddess, reminiscent of that of Artemis at Brauron, where she was revered as the great she-bear. As with most female cults, some scholars believe that the worship of the she-bear goddess transformed throughout the centuries into a witchcraft order, due to cultural changes and patriarchal pressures. The women who were once protectors of life, fertility and childbirth became witches who drained life force and harmed children, while their deity became a demon. The writings of ethnologist Tudor Pamphile offer invaluable insights into the existence of such witches and he described aerial battles between them and demons. These battles, he noted, were carried out under the command of a spirit known as Babakwaja. Her name means tree bark hag, referring to her otherworldly nature which she conceals by wearing skin that wrinkles and peels off like tree bark. She is said to be the queen of all evil spirits who feeds on the souls of unbaptized children. Many scholars have identified her with Samka or Avestica, and although they are not cognate, both their characters draw from the archetype of the old hag, which my previous video is about, and which I invite you to watch after this. Samka, likewise, is described in some tales and incantations to show herself as a crone or limping like an old woman with the limping belief to be caused by a hidden dragon tail, and her hooked and sharp nails made of iron are not only reminiscent of a bear's claws, but also a motif throughout hag lore that points to the instruments used by midwives in their practice. The aerial battles of Samka and Babakwaja are likewise reminiscent of the night battles originating in agrarian cults, researched by historian Carlo Ginzburg, who noted a connection to the Romanian queen of fairies, Irodasa, which I talk more about in my video about the maiden goddess also referred to as Herodias, Aradia, or the Old Fairy. She is said to be the goddess of witches and fairies who guides women through the cycles of life and death, ultimately keeping some of their spirits in her divine entourage and guiding others on their journey to the other world. Her entourage is exclusively female and known for spreading diseases, much like Samka. But Irodasa has the power to restore health, and her fairies can likewise imbue plants with healing properties. She seems to be the folkloric personification of Herodiana, a conjunction between the maiden goddess Diana, who was also a protector of childbirth, and Herecura, a goddess believed to be of Celtic origin, associated with the Roman underworld. Although Sanka's origins may be lost in time, she does embody an experience that is as old as time. The intriguing connections between her, fairies, and fertility cults reveal a hidden dimension to her character that makes her less demonic and easier to understand. She was born of worry, pain, sorrow, and loss, the kind that can only be fully grasped by those who have experienced it firsthand. She is the personification of a disease affecting mothers and their infants, she is the embodiment of nocturnal fears and anxieties associated with lineage, childbirth and miscarriage. She is the bane of midwives and witches, although she may have once been their ally. She is the ugly sister of fairies whose true names we may never know. Her presence tells the story of the profound fear and anguish associated with the perils of childbirth. Yet, beneath the shroud of darkness that surrounds her, there is a glimmer of understanding and empathy for the struggles faced by women throughout history. To me, Samka is not a demon. She is a symbol of shared experience. Until next time, remember, to know someone's true name is to hold a piece of their magic.